Hello and welcome to another episode, another serving, another heaping serving of owl bear soup. <laughs> I think I used sweet helping recently and it made my day. <laughs> oh my gosh. All right. We're back. Soup, uh, soup, soup. DJ Phoenix, <laughs> thanks for subscribing again. 30 months? Man, that is that is a long time. Um, I know. <laughs> keeping soup it requires requires very large um, spoons and uh, rubber bands. Oh, oh! I, I mean, I, a lot of it depends on the soup consistency. I think you know if it's congealed pretty mm -hmm. well, you can heap it up. Yeah, I'm a big fan of uh, like really, really, really dense soups. Like I, I'm, I'm a stew person. Yeah. Um, yeah. Yeah. But I, I do like a soup with like a a grilled cheese sandwich. So like. Uh, like okay. A, like a like a tomato, tomato, or uh, what's the minestrone? I like a minestrone with like <laughs> grilled cheese. <laughs> with grilled cheese, I like it. Uh, very yeah. very chunks, very chunks. I like mine to be you know like just one continuous fluid of some kind. So uh, the the more chunks, the the more I'm like nah, I don't want that. <laughs> so you like you like like a pea soup. Oh my gosh, split pea soup makes my day. <laughs> wow. All right, so we got a great show for everyone today. End of the show. Uh, that's it. We, Bye. <laughs> that's it. We're out. Uh, <laughs> end of the show forever. Uh, we have a fantastic guest today, uh, Alex Flag from Crafty Games. We'll be talking to him in a little bit. We have not one but two fantastic reviews to go over with you today uh as well as some news and um recipes if you stick along long enough we'll we'll give you some recipes uh that we stole from chef alberti himself <laughs> uh, the secret ingredient this week is and then you know you mix it in what so yeah exactly so oh, we'll get to that's it it's gonna be good i'm gonna be munching on blackberries <laughs> this entire stream i'm sorry <laughs> I have to get my good cholesterol up. I I, I got some blood work. <laughs> this is a okay. weird way for the show to go. I got some blood work done, and my good <laughs> cholesterol is low. And they told okay. me to eat more purple foods, including blackberries. So, oh wow, I didn't realize that eat more purple foods was like a thing that you could medically say to people. I like that. I mean, yeah, yeah, that was weird. Yeah. Okay, that was weird. What is so, that? Uh, blackberries. More uh, I guess no eggplant. Uh, blackberries, um, black raspberries. <laughs> okay. Yeah, white well, eggplant is. I can't eat eggplant. I'm allergic. Right, to it. right. So if you ever need to kill me, uh, <laughs> you know how to. Uh, cabbage it's on the wall. We've got purple it written cabbage. down. Yeah, purple cabbage. Okay. All right. So, <laughs> uh, unfortunately, our, our our Pathfinder game has died. Um, so I'm spending a lot of time playing Destiny 2 and right. um, some Ghosts of Tsushima, and uh, I just got the new Odd World, so I'll probably play through that. Uh, but we're oh, not wow. here to talk about video games. We're here to talk about D&D. &D. And Rich, I believe you've had mm. some D&D &D in the past week. I have. Um, so this is the big finale season for the Academy of Adventures, so all of my kids are running through this, this adventure that I have ridiculously created involving time travel so mm -hmm. the first thing i did they go explore this mage school it's it's where they studied chronomancy it's one of the few places you know I, I start making a big deal out of spells like haste and slow and how that alters time and so specialists work on that right and they got really excited and eventually very quickly i gave them i mean i gave them a time machine i gave them this little artifact that could move them through time very difficult to use they couldn't read the language they weren't sure how to set it up i kept saying like you know moon cycles and co uh, like convergences and things like that instead of just like type in a day you know like a delorean where you just type in the date you want to go to and uh mm -hmm. and it was amazing amazing to watch these kids decide what they were going to do with this time machine um i had written in that that basically with this little artifact they could go back to the academy and they would learn about two times that they could go back to and like you know this uh this villain is changing the past and so they need to go like reset it and then they'll end up getting to the the big conclusion um but i agree immediately question. oh yeah an important question from the chat this is super important was it bigger on the inside I, I think that it actually is, although they won't be able to experience it because it's it's I'm thinking about it as like this handheld, like you you hold it, it's, it's the gem on one side and then like dials on the other. So um, okay, they all have to touch, you know, 
make sure they're all in physical contact, someone hits the button. Um, and the thing I learned really quick is if you say that there's a button, um, the kids will immediately hit it. Um, or they'll mm -hmm. hit it with an ax, or they'll throw it at someone to see what happens, or like all sorts of ridiculous chaos. And uh, it was perfect. Um, if I didn't say button, then people would be like, we'll take it back to the academy safely and study it carefully. And it made me laugh right. so much just to see these groups like a button, <laughs> I hit it. Um, mm -hmm. And so I kept doing these things where, you know, they're, they're in this ridiculous location. They're at this mage school in these mountains. It's totally uninhabited. Uh, and no one's been in the school for a long time. So I basically, every time they hit it, unless they knew how to set it, I would just roll 2d6. I would roll randomly to see if they went to the past or the future. I'd ask them, like, are you in contact with anyone? Do you go alone? Uh, the thing only works once a day. And so there've been a lot of, of moments where it's like, okay, so you go back, you know, 900 years. There's no school here. There's no people here. There's no nothing here. You're in the mountains. What's your survival skill like? <laughs> what do you do to survive? And it's been really, really fun. Um, the other thing I'm doing is when they time travel, they have to make charisma saving throws to like hold their personality together while they travel. Ooh, and uh, I like that. If they, if they fail the save, they get sent back like up to like, I don't know, like two years early before everybody else shows up and they don't have the time machine. Oh. And so it's been oh, really no. fun to be like, okay, well, you, you know, they're going to show up at some point. They're not here yet. Uh, you, do you want to go to the place? What do you do for two years? And so we have these right. kids and they're like really quickly, like, well, I become a baker. Like, I'm just going to live in the town. I'm just going to be happy for a while. Like adventuring's hard work. <laughs> um, yeah. And, and some of them are like, well, I'm going to become a rebel leader. I'm going to go find all these people and I'm going to like start banding them together so that when everyone gets here, we're ready. And it's, it's so much fun to just hear them. Like I have two years is a dang long time. <laughs> it, um, it is. Yeah. yeah. What what would and you so, do as 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 an adventurer? Would you uh, where? What would you do for for two years? Well, one of these one of these moments in particular is is basically it's like it's like Pompeii, right? It's 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 this moment where mm -hmm. there is a city and they know that they're going here right before the volcano erupts and the whole place gets destroyed. And so, can they tell people about that? Can they? How how many people could you get out safely without like? inviting paradox into the situation because if everybody escapes right. or if you stop the thing from happening time changes and uh, i'm playing a, a pretty strict timeline in this uh time travel version so big changes like that would would cause huge backlash so awesome it's been pretty fun but nobody so i no, would sorry no, oh but but nobody has has made any big changes yet Oh, they're trying. In that one in particular, they, they try to save as many people as they can, like get ready so that when the event starts, they can like hustle people out, which is really cool. Like these mm -hmm. kids focused on like, let's save as many people as we can. Um, the other one is kind of this rebellion situation. So making it stronger and making sure that when they get the chance to do the thing they need to do, that they have more control over the situation is really fun. But I, I have a lot of respect for the one kid who was like, I'm I'm going to bake. I'm going to, I'm going to, I'm going to head over here. Yeah. Like that grand market. That's cool. I'm going to live in this city. Just see what it's like for a while. Um, to learn some new recipes. <laughs> Didn't really right. try to like build up a big thing. Just, just took a break knowing that at some point their friends would get back and their adventuring days would continue. But they have, they have two years and no one can tell them what to do. <laughs> I think I might do That's that. Amazing. Um, there have been, there was one kid. It was my baker. favorite one. I might, I might. Mm -hmm. One kid really specifically was like, oh my goodness. So my character became a hero because they learned stories about other heroes. That's part of their background. And so now they are saying that they are out there like doing things that will eventually become one of those stories to inspire themselves to become a hero later on. <laughs> oh, that's amazing. I love that so it's much. Great. And I, I have like three paragraphs written, right? This is all just like, just group storytelling, like, you know, big beats that I mm -hmm. want to get to in each of these, but it's so much just what would you do? And and watching these kids create is, has been very, very cool. <laughs> yeah. If you, if you think back to, to you know, talking about the storytelling, if you think back to um, when we had Teos on and, and, and we were talking about D and D and stuff and, talking about adventure writing one of the things that he he brought up was there's an adventure that where you start out and you are in a car and you know how how in in, in certain action movies you hit the ramp and the car is in the air yep. mm -hmm. we start the game in the air 
uh that's where the the session starts you are all in right. there like you have to decide who's the driver who's at what no, no. well that uh -huh. was a spycraft <laughs> game so uh you know and, and 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 we've done that a lot so um uh -huh. I'm definitely going to be bringing that up with Alex since he's he's the guy behind Spycraft, which we'll see in a year and a right? little bit. I love that because it's it's a moment where like you're still kind of on the rail that you as the storyteller want it to be on, but there's so much so mm -hmm. much freedom to just let people like make those cool decisions and make the story theirs. And it's not going to like change things, <laughs> but it is gonna make mm -hmm. things very cool and very personal. So yeah. Yeah, yeah. It's been a fun All week. Right. We only got two weeks left. <laughs> then then what then what happens oh well then of course i mean i have a kickstarter going right now for the summer camp uh we've definitely funded that and i'm excited to be telling more stories all summer long with kids like teaching them how to dm that's the biggest draw so far is kids mm -hmm. want to be able to, to use the tools of DD to like run their own stories which is very cool they they can kind of they've been watching me do it they've but they haven't they don't know exactly all the pieces and so it's going to be a lot of like right, right. you know confidence building by by trying it out stuff like that I I can't wait and so mm -hmm. that Kickstarter the Academy of Adventure Summer Camp for 2021 is on Kickstarter right now and uh, and if you want to check it out if you've got kids who are ages 11 to 15 want to play some D and D send them my way <laughs> we have fun <laughs> perfect. <laughs> Perfect. Um, all right. Well, uh, I think uh, let's go ahead and kick it off and let's dig, dig into some news. Cool, cool. Ooh. What you got Well, for in us? that case, first up, uh, this is really an exciting thing for me. I, I'm very happy about this. I mean, um, when I think about board games on Kickstarter, I'm a Kickstarter junkie. You know me. Mm -hmm. Gloomhaven, yeah. huge, big deal, right? And yeah. the sequel, Frosthaven, huge. brought in almost 13 million dollars on kickstarter which is not not what i'm used to with the kickstarter that's for sure I, no. I think it's the the record at this point uh for a game i'm not positive um but um there was an update very recently and it was uh it was very positive it was basically the the creator of Frosthaven kind of looked through it and and started thinking about kind of the the world that he was representing and uh and he wanted to to give this explanation of how he's taking the moment to make the narrative better, you know? <laughs> so, so going in and doing yeah. a lot of the things that, that we kind of expect games to be doing right now, like looking at real world connotations and making sure they're not upholding any sort of stereotypes that, that, uh, that we see in our world and we don't want things like that. Um, and, uh, and talking to people, making sure that we've got cultural consultants coming on board so that they can, like, mm -hmm. as he says, collaboratively come up with solutions that expand and strengthen the narrative um, through this process. And it's it's exciting. It's very cool because, I mean, number one, it's going to make the game awesome, so much better um, for so many more people. And I also love it because it's not just... Uh, uh, this is it's a big game. Like this, you know, the record-breaking game. Yeah. This game has... Right. Uh, Oh, I was just looking at it. 83,000 backers, right? Uh, a huge force in, in independent gaming saying, I want to do this right. I'm going to take a moment to do it. I'm going to explain what I'm doing. And I'm doing mm -hmm. it, right? It's it's like using, yeah. if Kickstarter is the market, this is using the market for good. And I'm I'm really happy to see it. Yeah. Uh, you know, I, I think it's important for games that have any kind of you know, borrow from cultures to tell the story to, to to have people who are involved with the culture to to make sure that um, that you're not misrepresenting that you're 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 doing it justice you're not doing anything um, you know uh, untoward to 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 right. someone's court culture and you know and that's a great way to move into this next game uh, this is from crafty games this is on Kickstarter this is called Boru. Um, and this game was, uh, was worked by, by, by the team at Crafty Games, uh, Alex Flagg, um, and he's been working with, um, I'm, I'm, unfortunately, I'm not going to try to pronounce the game, but somebody from Ketchup Games, which is an, uh, an, an, an Indonesian, our Indonesian artists, uh, Ketchup Games is an Indonesian based, uh, game mm -hmm. company. And they're bringing forth this this fantastic game. It's beautiful looking. It's a yeah. uh, it's a Euro style game. It's called Buru. Uh, you can go to Buru uh, BuruGame.com right now to go check it out. Uh, it, it looks fantabulous, and it goes into Kickstarter phase tomorrow. 
right? It's tomorrow. Yeah. So this is a good preview moment. I, I'm a big fan mm -hmm. of this kind of level. Like uh, it calls itself a light to midway Euro game, uh, which has has like bidding, action selection, you know, uh, engine mm -hmm. building. I love all of that stuff. And if it gets too out of hand, if it gets to the heavyweight Euro, it's it's no longer for me. But this I, I oh, my gosh, like I just looked at this page and I was like, I want this game. <laughs> I want to play this game 10 times. <laughs> right. This is in my 10 by 10 yeah. for this year, you know? <laughs> Very cool. There we go. I just tossed a link in the chat. Uh, oh good. man, yeah, Frost Haven is still up there for the most funded board game at twelve million nine hundred thousand yeah. dollars. It's uh, it's it's a lot. <laughs> that you is, know, it's that enough is that a lot, a lot. I've been talking about the RPGs that hit a million, and everybody's eyes go wide, like what? But yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, Frost Haven. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, yeah. Well other big combinations let's go big um let's talk dnd &D. let's big? talk about magic the gathering let's talk about them at the same time because <laughs> we have a better preview of the adventures in the forgotten realms magic the gathering set that is coming out that will be making its way into the world um let's see available july 8th the world release will be on july 23rd so they're going to slowly be be giving us more hints about what's coming but right now there's some exciting stuff are you ready? Are you ready? <laughs> I, I don't know what you're talking about. Oh, no. <laughs> oh, <laughs> I had to look at the screen. Oh, my gosh. This picture, I think, is incredible. This is Tiamat, right? So the, the reimagining of Tiamat specifically for Magic the Gathering. It's got the five. I mean, of course, it's a perfect example. The five heads, the five fiery breaths coming out of them or whatever, you know five colors of fire you need for magic um they've uh they released tiamat they released the arts and then also let us know that whenever tiamat enters the battlefield this legendary dragon god which costs just a ton of mana to put out um search your library for up to five dragon cards not named tiamat that each have different names reveal them put them into your hand and then shuffle your deck so this is tiamat is like wait how much i call how much dragon. mana is tiamat i gotta figure this it, out it's one of each and two uh, 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 blanks. Oh, my. It's not blanks. Uh, colorless. I haven't played Magic in a couple of years. Colorless. Thank you. <laughs> uh, so seven uh, mana for this one, right? Um, wow. Yeah. But if you got a you know, dragon deck, the top... you're going to go right into it. <laughs> right. Yeah. I'm, I'm playing a lot of uh, uh, Arena right now. And one of the, the top decks that I keep running against and I, I don't have a real answer for is a uh, five color deck. So yeah. Um, so so the tools are there. Um, you're gonna see Tiamat in play. I mean, I think so. Um, All right. At least always, hope yeah. So. Oh yeah. Yeah. With some of the right tools for sure. Um, mm -hmm. I love it. Tiamat is one of their big ones. So there's also they're putting it out with like a, a full art style and borderless sort of thing. Um, they're also doing some other cool stuff with borders. They they showed off a beholder. Um, excuse me, an eye tyrant. Um. And uh, and the image and the background of it looks very monster manual like, which is a cool look for this. It's still got like a black border around it, but it feels like mm -hmm. like you're looking at the the fiend folio, which is very cool. Um, oh, that's awesome! Yeah, so I'm excited to see cards like that. Their their big reveal for for right now, of course, is the Vorpal Sword, which they've put in here. It costs one mm -hmm. black mana to put into play, because of course it's a uh, it's a swampy card. Um, it's an equipment. It's an artifact. Um, when you mm -hmm. equip it to a creature, they get death touch. They get plus two, plus zero. And then here's the big deal with the Vorpal Sword. All your, how are you going to recreate the Vorpal Sword in Magic? Well, if yeah. you spend five colorless and three black mana, until the end of the turn, Vorpal Sword gains another ability, which is whenever the equipped creature deals combat damage to a player, that player loses the game. <laughs> <laughs> that's amazing. <laughs> oh, that's so awful. It's just, I spend a ton of mana. I attack. You block it or you lose. Like you. <laughs> oh my god. <laughs> Which I really like. I think just... that's. I love alternate win conditions. So. <laughs> just just do uh you know a black blue deck, and mm -hmm. then uh, use those whales, or the dolphins <laughs> that 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 un prevent another creature from being blocked as it attacks. Oh right, right. So we, we'll just like we'll 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 win this with Island Walk. Is that what you're saying? Like, <laughs> yeah, pretty much. Yeah, it's essentially Island Walk, but they don't have Island Walk I'm gonna, anymore. I'm gonna have my, oh, my Merfolk Merfolk <laughs> Vorpal Sword deck. I'm gonna love it. 
Yeah. All right. I'm weirdly I'm ready excited to play, yeah. about this. Yeah, the more cards I see, the, the happier I get. <laughs> are you are you getting back into magic? I don't know. I don't know. I mean, yeah. I don't know. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> I, I cannot tell you how much I love opening a box. Like that. Whew. Like get to the pre-release, <laughs> go to the pre-release draft, get some cool cards, get a box, go home. That's a it's a powerful feeling. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. Well, I mean, uh, yeah. How do you follow? How do you follow up all that magic news? I think I think that's it. We'll go home. Soup's done. What? What? No, yeah. we got to follow uh, it with something else <laughs> I want very badly. <laughs> yeah. Uh, all right. So from for this one, I want really badly. This is um, League of Infamy. Is a new game coming from Mantic Games. Um, in uh, this this game is a cooperative dungeon crawler uh, where you play the villains and. Uh, and it's it, I just love everything like Mantic does. They do such a good job with their miniatures. Um, looking over this game, the artwork looks fantastic. It looks very easy to follow. There's some cool mechanics with this game. Um, you get like starting equipment, and as you kind of go through, you build up your villain and all this stuff. It's it, it, and they're releasing more and more about it now. Um, it mm-hmm. will be uh, for sales and shipping starting May 24th. So you still have time to pre-order if you want to jump cool. in on that. Um, I'm pretty excited about this game. This looks pretty rad. Wow. Uh, I like cooperative villainy. <laughs> right. It's always a fun I, zone. I, yeah, I like I like more co-op games. And um in, in in the fact that this one is is being put out by Mantic. And if you look at the board, it kind of looks like you put the dungeon together as you kind of go through it. Oh, very um, cool. There's a lot of, lot of really cool pieces. Um, let's see here. What's in the box? There's the rule book, uh, six playable plastic playable villains, which their minis are gorgeous, so uh, you're not going to be disappointed. Uh, a plastic Dracon. Uh, 28 plastic Elven and Dracon defenders, uh, so the pointy-ear do-gooders. And uh, six punch boards, including Elven sanctuary tiles and 220 game tokens, 13 custom dice, and 232 cards. Jeez, and it's a uh, yeah, and it's a uh, eighty nine euros, so probably about a hundred bucks or so. Wow, wow. Okay, <laughs> yeah, that sounds very cool. Um, I oh, yeah, I'm super excited about that. I like kicking down the door and seeing what's next, knowing that it's a whole room is very cool. <laughs> yeah. Wow. Um, let's see. Um, gosh, do I have a transition? No. Um, we could talk about a villain i suppose um i am really excited because right we've got in indian news the van richten's guide to ravenloft coming out and it's led to i mean ravenloft has not never gone away on the dungeon masters guild people love putting out content for ravenloft but like a new resurgence a bunch of new things lately and one of them that I really like is is a new book called Van Richten Dies in Ravenloft. Uh, this is by uh, Ashton Duncan. Uh, and it's fantastic because it's just a retelling of Death House, which if you run Curse of Strahd, mm-hmm. how did you like uh, Death House? I, I, <laughs> I ran a very interesting version of Curse of Strahd. So okay. my Death House experience was not the same as everyone else's. That's fair, right? So Death House is like, it's an interesting campaign where you're going to explore this new world. And one of the first major encounters that happens is Death House, which is the most like meat grindery, kill everyone sort of uh-huh. events, I think, in the whole book. I'm not sure. Maybe Strahd's Castle, yeah. but I never got that far. Um, but it is it is deadly and it's really early. And uh, a lot of people didn't like it. And um I don't know. I mean, I I'm okay with that tactical experience, but I think I need to be told in advance that that's what's happening, right? Like in um yeah, uh, Tomb of Annihilation. Or are we gonna play this in Death Grinder mode? Cool. Okay. I just need to know we're doing it. <laughs> so yeah. Um, this book in particular, Van Richten dies in Ravenloft, is an attempt to rewrite Death House as more of a clue-like experience, like turn it into hmm. much more of a mystery. You're exploring this huge house because it's like a 
a four-story house filled with all sorts of monsters and things. They've uh, they've rewritten many of those rooms to have like traps and mysteries and things to make it a little bit more approachable. Um, and they've also, of course, added Rudolf Van Richten as an NPC, um, bringing them inside Curse of Strahd and allowing them to be kind of a source of information who can give you like Taroka readings and all sorts of things. Like you, you find their journal, um, and all sorts of stuff, like a powerful monster hunter that you get to meet right away who can give you a lot of information, uh, except their memory is a little bit hazy for reasons. Um, <laughs> so I love this. You just basically download it and you uh, you look at the map in Curse of Strahd and you run this instead and you give your players kind of a, a much more investigative, um, I won't say comic, but you know, uh, a much lighter version of the Death House, which is, is how I want to be introduced to Curse of Strahd, honestly. I think this is fantastic. Yeah, you know. Meanwhile, I, I I I do love the meat grindery type of experience where your character is constantly on the edge of of, of dropping. Um, yeah. <laughs> so there, there's been there's been a lot of focus on 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 uh, relative right. Relatively, there's been a lot of focus on Revenoff. If they expanded beyond Revenoff, and this 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 question goes out the chat too. Um, what what setting would you really what what setting do you think would be the best one to see and which setting do you think would be the one that you wanted? Cause they may not be the same. Like which setting do I want them to dig into and do more of? Yeah. Or hmm. start into right. Versus or start, I or mean, also, what, or, 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 or what setting do you feel like, uh, you know, you, you personally want, but you don't think it's a good business move. So they probably won't do it. Oh, well, you already know my answer to this. Like, I <laughs> I would love them to modernize Birthright. I think that would be incredible. Yeah. I mean, I love the ideas in that setting. That world is, I mean, if you want to talk about antiquated D&D, &D, uh, Birthright does mm -hmm. it <laughs> very well. Um, you know, it's it's not, yeah. I want that world to be absolutely, like, reflective of an actual, like, diverse world. That would be pretty cool. Um so that would be my big one because I love like the idea of us all as the Grand Council running, like defeating these these huge monsters that run, you know, entire realms around here. That's my favorite. Um, yeah. Oh, man. I, yeah, I, well, I agree with mid armor. I, uh, I think the Dota 2 setting would be awesome. <laughs> yeah. 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 I'm into yeah. that. Uh, mm -hmm. I think that would be great. Uh, I, I, I think my personal setting like that I would like to see is a, a dedicated Planescape setting. Uh, sure. But I think, I think the, the the I think honestly, like, I mean, whenever we're getting close to sixth edition, I I, I really wanted to just drop, um, finally drop Spelljammer, because because <laughs> it's just yeah, such a right. running joke on Twitter. Mm -hmm. So uh, uh, that would be fun. That's I mean, that's a good like ooh, final yeah. thing to do. <laughs> yeah, I like the, the the old privateer setting from Wing Commander. Yeah, that would be good too. I like that. Oh, oh my man! Gosh. All right, uh, oh. we were talking about monsters. Um, oh yeah. So, in speaking of monsters and privateers, uh, Privateer Press has is is revising the rules for for Monster Apocalypse. Uh, it's a miniature game. It used to be a blind pack game. It's not anymore. Uh, it's a really fun game if you want to play a couple of kaiju's smashing into each other. Uh, this this is this is one of my favorite ways to do it uh, is is through this game and it's totally you know if you like collecting miniatures if you like uh, you know squad style games this game yeah. check it out it's it's a really <laughs> solid fun game oh my gosh <laughs> the I, the title of this article is uh, because it is monster apocalypse documentation is monster documentation and yes. I stopped right there and I just had to stare at that for like five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah 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 well i mean it's that's it's a word. uh yeah <laughs> that's a word and it's it's beautiful that the, the way they used it so i like it i i oh, being a kaiju just breaking stuff sounds fun <laughs> it does doesn't it um it does let's see uh my my last one up here is do 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 oh that's right it's another product on the dm's guild i was really excited about this one um because um candle keep mysteries is like was a surprise to me. I don't know if it was a surprise to you. Um, as I, I don't know, it was a collection of adventures, right? And they like freed people up to get wacky. Like one of my favorite ones in yeah. there is uh, is by Amy Vorpal. Like 
you go in and you realize that one of the towers of Candlekeep is actually like a rocket and someone is trying to launch it and go to space. <laughs> and you have options, like one of the possible outcomes is now that's your rocket and you're in space. Um, you know, you could stop the whole thing. You could let them leave. Like it's a huge open-ended adventure. It's so fun. Um, I love the wacky. And um, and so I wanted to take a look at one that was inspired by this wackiness called The Glitter Grimoire. This is on DMs Guild right now. It's by a host of authors. Uh, uh, let's see. We've got Steve Pankatai. We've got Ryan Langer. We've got Chris Hopper and the Grimoire writers. Um, this is like a Lisa Frank style book of spells and magic items. Um, and oh, I did see that. <laughs> yeah, that's amazing. <laughs> It's really cool. Like the whole thing is set up to look like a spiral notebook, kind of. So it's got like the whole center PDF has that that spiral. It's got doodles all over the place that kind of feel, you know, like you are. I don't know. You wrote this in high school and uh, it's really, really cool. There's a lot of good items. There's a lot of things that you want when you're feeling a little bit silly in a game. Right. Um, one of the cantrips, my favorite one, it's uh, they've got a full like 19 page preview. The very first one, um, I could never get it out of my mind, is catnip. You uh, you point to someone, you concentrate, and cats like that person. Like they are now catnip to yeah. cats. <laughs> um, I feel like cool. I, I am catnip to cats. I'm not a big yeah. cat person. So uh, <laughs> yeah. But they gather. <laughs> but they gather um, at me. Right. Uh, what about a cantrip called finger guns? You nod, you make a really cool finger gun gesture at a creature within range. Uh, they feel cool and confident. They get a D4 temporary hit points and they get advantage on their next charisma saving throw. <laughs> oh, man, that's that's right. hilarious. I love it. I love it. So it's just it's full of stuff like this, like like spells, uh, interesting items that I can see on here. Um uh, which are silly, right? The uh, the squeaky warhammer, right? With little little like bouncy ends that. <laughs> It would be That's a great so toy. Um, <clears throat> the very rare Cloak of Rainbows. There's the Dish of Ruined Taste on here. I mean, there's just a ton of stuff. And if your game is uh, a little silly or if you want to add some silliness to it, I think this is a very, very cool way to check it out. Um, it is, let's see, a 43-page PDF. Um, and it is something that you can get on Prince on Demand here. You can get it soft cover, uh, but the PDF is about 15 bucks. Awesome, awesome. Um, I do have some... So next bit of news, a little bit of bad news. Rich, your pastime of getting in fistfights at Target, well, you're going to have to find another reason. Um, and that what? is because to ensure the safety of their guests and team members, effective May 14th, uh, that was two days ago, Target will no longer be selling MLB, NFL, NBA, or Pokemon trading cards. Um, and this is because <laughs> people were using it as an excuse to get in fistfights <laughs> in the store. Instead of battling to see who was best Pokemon master or who had the best fantasy NBA team. Um, yeah. So bad news. You're going to find someplace else or find just find another reason for your fist fights. So I'm right. sure there's something you can fight over in Target. Wow. Like on a, on a, a surface level, that's sad for, for people who want to get those cards and Target's a good way to do it. But yeah. on a deeper level, that's mm -hmm. just sad. Like That's just that whole yeah. thing. Oh, my goodness. It is. Uh. It's, it's, it's ridiculous. Yeah. You know, and uh, I, I read a, an interesting article. Um, someone, someone's blaming it on, uh, is it Jake or Aaron Paul? One of those, one of those brothers, oh. because they, right. uh, it's like, uh, yeah, whatever. But it, it was, it was, it was just kind of funny to, to read about how popular Pokemon has gotten because people like them and other streamers, even right here on Twitch, buy these super expensive, like first edition boxes and they just open all the cards and it's, right, it becomes right. such a rush. Mm -hmm. um, there are these groups that you can join where you uh, you you collectively buy a brick of cards, and then you and this is for baseball cards and sports cards. I think they do it for other things too. But but you get randomly assigned like a team or so, something like that, and um, and 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 so they open this box of cards and you get all of them by that from that team. Um, oh, but, I you see. know you're okay. both being a pack of cards from like 1919, so everyone throws in like 20 bucks. And you know, and if that pack just doesn't have any of your your team in there, well, SOL. But if you get right, something right. super valuable, then you know, right? And that's kind of the gambling beyond beyond it. Yeah, I I, I agree with uh, DJ Phoenix fighting over the last <laughs> PS5. That's fine. Fighting over Pokemon cards, <laughs> nah. I'm into that. Oh my gosh, <laughs> I, I I still remember. I think hearing stories about people. Um, 
what was it chaos orb like the old magic chaos orb was a card that you had to tear up into confetti and you threw at someone's cards oh. and whatever it touched would vanish and so if i cast yeah. control artifact and i take your chaos orb and i tear it up <laughs> oh, then you God. get to hit me but like otherwise i i didn't have a lot of fights about cards as a kid <laughs> no no so it's no sad that's that happening oh, now. that's brutal uh let's see here uh also a new version of the hit board game pandemic is free for print and play uh hot, Z oh. uh, hot zone europe was going to show up in store soon but you can try it right now so um if you hope hop over to i think that z-man games go check out their site you should find some more information about that over there um and then um i have just one more kickstarter to talk about and then we'll cool. we'll, we'll dive into reviews um, and this one's appropriate because uh, we're actually going to have some of these pieces to show you here in just a second. But this is the uh, Dungeons and Lasers third edition. So this is modular towns, fantasy, uh, fantasy buildings, NPCs, all kinds of, of of cool stuff, including a 5e campaign. Um, you know, there's there's animal companion. There's so much cool stuff. Uh, this this Kickstarter only has three days left to go. So if you want to uh, get in on it, get in on it soon. Otherwise, I do think you can order it through their site at a later time. Uh, but yeah, uh, totally, totally, we're jumping into. I don't know why we 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 missed this one when we were looking through things, but uh, <laughs> you know, we don't review a lot of terrain, so uh, I'll, I'll I'll blame it on that, but. Um, if if any other terrain makers out there want us to review it, I am happy to do so. I I have a lot of thoughts. You do, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> That's a thing I know. <laughs> yeah, very cool. I have opinions, and I have some opinions about these. So uh, should we go ahead and get on over to that? Let's do it. All right. Transition. <laughs> Transition. All right. I, I mean, while we were transitioning, I should have grabbed some stuff, but whatever. <laughs> Here we go. All right. So, um, so I have a, I, I took a few pictures. I took a lot more pictures, but my camera was was getting a little wonky. Uh, this first picture is from the Sci-Fi Core set. Uh, so this is, uh, you know, like as you can see in the in the picture, there's uh, in it, Rich. Hopefully, you're watching on another screen. Uh, yeah. You know, there's these floor <laughs> tile pieces and these wall tile pieces. And the cool thing about the walls is you can flip them around, and there's different on other each side. So. Oh. What I want to show everyone, what I really like about these is how they go together. And I'm going to, I'm going to show you this live because the pictures didn't come out well. So they have these little pieces right here, and we'll see those again soon. Um, these little pieces go, so this is a, the bottom of a floor tile, right? So okay. they connect like this, right? And so then oh, they hey. have this, and then you just, you know, you connect it like so. Uh, this is hard to do while looking at a camera that has a delay, but... <laughs> <laughs> All right, and then you have your your little dungeon, right? Your little dungeon area. Um, I like that. And then, yeah, no, it's really good. And then like they these ones. So like right here, there's a hole. So these are a little bit different piece. I'll take that off in a second. Um, and uh, so see that little uh, thing at the bottom? They just slide right in and they pop right yeah. out. Uh, wow. Each of these wall pieces have two different sides, right? So you can see um what's going on right uh so now that magic piece i was talking about this piece right here so that's yeah. the one that you plug it into so it has that little loop where it goes underneath it and then you just slide this right into there right like so and then boom you have a wall wow okay um, super Andy. cool super <laughs> cool super cool also <laughs> they, they they thought of so many things and i was just like as i was going through these putting them together i discovered so many cool little quirks so then they have these these holes in the middle of the floor right here Great. where they come together i was curious so you can put you know you can put other walls and stuff just right in there like that and oh gotcha okay you know, create more dividers and stuff yeah so it's super cool i was showing you bits doorways the, to go there uh, the f the fantasy set uh, they, uh, I didn't get any doorways in the set that I have, but okay. um, you know, th there may be some. I don't want to say yes or no, but I didn't get any. So anyway, sci-fi set. Sci-fi set is so cool. It has um, these cool floor tiles um, in the walls, and everything just looks really, really, really sharp. Uh, looking at the fantasy set, similar layout. That's the one that I just held up here. As you can see, like the minis fit on it very well. Um, they, you can see the one of the things I like about the train oh, yeah. is being able to see the squares 
and be able to play around with them, right? Mm -hmm. um, and if it, some terrain that I have, they 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 don't they don't have those. So you kind of have to guess. Like um, the Dwarven Forge, they do a really good job with it as well, where you can kind of see the squares. It, it makes it super super helpful. So uh, yeah, so I tossed some of my favorite minis on this one, so we could look at it and see what it looks like live. Uh, this is the Fantasy Core set. Um, really great, really solid set. All right, and here is the Hall of Heroes. Yeah, uh, here's the Hall of Heroes. Hall of Heroes, slightly different set, but this is more like your dwarven crypt. Um, in in uh, I, I look, it, you can barely see it, but on the on the box it says there are no such things as traps here. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, Who but uh, yeah, but that's a really cool like dwarven area, and that uh, it yeah exactly. I I agree with a uh, death's chokehold. Yeah, this is this is really smooth looking uh, set right here. I love yeah, I yeah. love that smooth stone look. It's it's real real good. I'm I'm very pleased with this. Oh, I hit the wrong button, so we'll just <laughs> jump on back. There we okay. go. Um, and then uh, so then there was a uh the town sewer set. Uh, I'm always <laughs> right, yeah, people exactly. do this. Yeah. <laughs> Agatha Wink, 100. percent Uh, so okay, so I I, <laughs> I I took a picture with with just some of the individual pieces, so you could see, um, that the the sewer set has these really cool tiles, um, and and these tiles I do do want to talk about a little bit. The clear plastic tiles are a little more brittle than the 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 gray plastic um so whenever you're taking these apart because they come on sprues whenever you're taking these apart wear wear glasses uh oh yeah plastic okay. flies and it it, it does it does yeah. have some some oomph to it too uh but they're beautiful uh they're fantastic they go together really well if you look there there's a group in the sewers um, you can see the little areas for walking. They're they're raised up a little. What I'm going to do is I'm going to go through. And I'm going to paint those a little bit, but I'm going to try to keep it so it looks like some of the funk is over it. Um, yeah, no. So, so once again, uh, just tossed a couple of minis on there just to see what it looks like. Yeah. Real sharp, real good looking. I'm. Yeah. Yeah. This is from episode five, right? This is from Empire Strikes Back. Yeah. This. Okay. Yeah. That's 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 the scene from episode five. Yeah, that's what I. Thought. Um, <laughs> Uh, so oh, I, I I like the sci-fi corridors. I decided to put them in there twice, or I just started going the wrong way. Oh, <laughs> oh no, that's actually it. I yes, that's right. I, I was missing a bunch of photos. Okay, so now let me show you a couple of things because the photos just I, I I for some reason the photos did not turn out. Um, but here we go. Show them off. I'm excited about this. I I like this uh, uh, just because. I like the idea that this is all going to lay flat. I'm very excited about like yeah. storing this stuff. Whoa. Exactly. Yeah. So, so this is this is your <laughs> this is your sprue uh, pack with connectors. These connectors are interchangeable between all the sets. So like I I'm not going to probably break apart all of these. So this is this is a warning to folks who get it. You don't necessarily need to break apart all these as soon as you get them because you can build plenty of sets with what comes in one box. So I would gotcha. break those off as you're building them. Uh, and so here's what a, a sprue looks like for like the dungeons, fantasy dungeon set. So my my other warning, and, and, and these are really beautiful. My other warning is these uh, connectors. If, if you're used to terrain from places like Games Workshop, these connectors are a little bit thicker. Uh, you're going to want to put a little more gusto into it. But the reason for that is like, these these are pretty thick plastic, right? They oh wow, you know, like yeah. I, I I can't bend that, right? You know, so it's it's ready to go right out of the box. The other piece of advice I have is uh, either get an exacto knife or a uh, some some high grit sandpaper because you are going to see. Let's see if we can get a picture of that. Uh, those flash marks, right? You see those dots yeah, across the top. Mm -hmm. Yeah, w whenever whenever you're you're putting together your Let's uh your um your floor tiles like these, you're gonna want to make sure and smooth that out. Like so, like I went through and I use an exacto knife to smooth this out, um, so that these fit evenly and they're just like oh, bam. Gotcha. Interesting. Right? That's really funny because it's uh you know we have a lot of people who, if they're getting into miniatures and they're doing it right now, they're getting like pre-molded like 
you know, they're done, right? But <laughs> there were a lot yeah. of minis once upon a time. There still are, of course, where you had to decide what arms you were going to put on to the torso and change weapons out. And so there was a lot of that specific, like, sprue work that you don't necessarily have to do right now. So good reminder. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so yeah, yeah. And that's and that's one of those things. Yeah, Hobby Blade, yeah. Yeah. Um, mm -hmm. In in that def, definitely yeah that's that's it's one of those things where you don't really know unless you you dig into sprues often yeah. right like so right. you know I have this uh, um, beautiful dra uh, dragon this one's great I have not put this one together yet but it's beautiful uh, wow. the reason because I I wanted to show the sprue right in in, in that's this for this type of thing so when you get the dragon this is the sprue sprue you get for, one of the sprues you get for the dragon. And if you look, like it has a really nice large base uh, with lots of really cool detail, and mm -hmm. you know, and, and it comes in these kinds of things. So when you're putting it together, um, oop, that's the wrong side. When you're putting it together, you know, <laughs> you you just need to you, you you need to know that that's part of it, right? Right. Um, the nice thing is a lot of these pieces have these nice little uh, nubbins where you can easily sure. slot things in together, and just a dip of of of. Uh, glue will will hold them together and you'll want to get plastic glue you'll want to get glue for minis too because you don't want to use right. you can use super glue but super what super glue does is it is it melts the plastic and it makes it brittle and uh that that can cause some issues with your miniatures wow wow wow, wow. one more thing That's i want to show cool. you this is this is this is my favorite thing i'm i'm going <laughs> to put together and and build all of these um but i didn't want to like take them out until i was ready to base put a base coat on them uh these my friend are wild knights look at all of those like companions on there oh my gosh i see birds so many I companions see, what the what <laughs> look at that one right there yeah that's, that's a really cool oh, mimic, uh, mimic yeah it's it's so good oh man i uh i can't say enough about these they are so they are so cute they're so good um Hit me up if there's anything specific anyone wants to see. Hit me up in the uh, uh, Saving Throw Discord, um, and I'm happy to take pictures of individual pieces. I'm not going nice. to take pictures of the entire sprues and put those up, but if you want to see an individual piece, you want to see something specific, let me know. I'll take some pictures. That way you can get in on this. Um, I'm Justin slash Owlbear Soup. I just post in the Owlbear Soup channel. Thank you for yeah. posting that Discord link, DJ Regular. Um, also, oh, so thanks cool. for the 50 months, Texas Devin. Whew, Hello, 50 months. I don't <laughs> wow. even know that I'm that old. Um, yeah, it's so cool. It's it's a really cool set, and I'm super looking forward to continuing to dig through it, clean up the the edges, paint everything, and be ready for whenever we can all sit around the table and play games again. I, I got to say, I mean, I think that all looks really good. I love that familiar set. It shows that they know their audience really well because that's everybody yeah. who's, I want that so badly. Like I love it when my students yeah. pick their pets and I just want us to have cool pets all the time. <laughs> yeah. Very yeah, cool. No, it's, it's awesome. Um, yeah. Um, but yeah, I don't know. I, I don't, I don't have a whole lot more to say about it. They, uh, I will say they, they, they go together very easily. It takes a little bit of cleanup. Um, and, uh, it, but they're super tough. I'm probably going to use these more than I use my Dwarven Forge, uh, just because they clip together so well. So you can build everything yeah. and then take it by pieces. Um, but, I, but they're like going to get a lot of play in my house. Yeah. Good. Glad to hear it. Yeah. So. That's a, that's a very smart set. I like it a lot. Um, the Kickstarter is up yeah. for, like you said, three more days and, uh, and you can three choose more a whole lot of different price points to decide what kind of terrain you want to get. What kind of terrain? What kind of add-ons? You know, I don't have everything that they 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 sent, uh, but uh, if you look through there, there's a lot of really cool things, and I may have to order some extras because I mean yeah. they are they are pretty sweet. Like the you know like I really like the um, the lava caverns specifically on the site. Uh, if you look over if, on the uh, Kickstarter, so I would check that oh, nice. out. The wooden cottage looks great. Yeah, yes. there's definitely a few things in there where I'm just super I'm super into them. Um, I was just looking at I the cursed cathedral. <laughs> exactly, and I and I think the that the way the dungeons all snap together is really smart. Yeah, um, and you can throw those pieces like in a bag, and then just have everything else flat in like a container. You're good to go. Right. Um, yeah. <laughs> 
Cool, cool. So once again, yeah. So this is a uh, once again, this is the uh, Dungeons and Lasers third edition. Uh, DJ regular tossed the chat or the the link in the chat for us uh, on our Discord. So swing over there, check it out. Back this. You got three days left. Um, uh, yeah, it's super good. <laughs> wow! Wow! Perfect. All right. Well, I think we got another review. Are you ready? We do. Let's see. Do we want to jump in? We want to dive in? <laughs> uh, let's let's do a little uh, little screen shifting magic, and then we'll dive right on right. in. I'm so excited. I just want to spend a little bit of time talking to you about the Sentinel Comics role-playing game uh, by Greater Than Games. This is this is a role-playing game that came out uh, last year. It's based on Sentinels of the Multiverse, the, the card game that is just hitting its, what, 10-year anniversary this year, I think? Um, and they're mm -hmm. doing a Kickstarter for like the definitive final edition. But I've been very excited for this role-playing game. I got to, uh, the chance to play test it uh, a couple years back, and I think it is very fun uh, if you want to jump into a superhero style game and start telling some pretty wild stories. Um, so uh, I love it because uh, its adventures uh, are being told in the sense of comic books, right? Each each pre-written adventure is its own unique comic. I, I put a couple covers on one of these pages. Um, but, uh, but I wanted to start by taking a look at just one of the characters in particular to show you how the game kind of works, tell you a bit about the mechanics. Um, and, uh, and yeah, start letting you tell your stories. Um, so this next page, this is one of my favorite characters to play actually in the normal Sentinels is uh, is uh, absolute zero here. Um, you can see a thing I find very interesting about this compared to a lot of role-playing games. This is the first page of the character sheet and it's mostly cool flavor information, right? Talks about my costume, talks about my, my alias, talks about my basic characteristics, um, how I got my powers. Um, but most of the page is set up for my principles. Um, this is like, uh, you know, in D D D terms, your twists, your, your, uh, traits i suppose um your bonds these are the two things that really define absolute zero and they tell me what my role-playing things might be and i can i can use pre-written stuff which we'll talk about or i can come up with these on my own um during role-playing i'm reliant on my coolant suit and i cannot normally function without it that's going to come up just when i'm telling stories and uh, my principles of cold i have an affinity to the cold i can interact with cold temperatures and effects with ease right um things that come up and because those things come up, they also give me twists. That's going to be a big part of this game. Um, how could those things go wrong? If a twist occurs, how does my suit get damaged? How do how do I lose my power over the cold? Things like that. And I love that it's right here on like the first page because it is so important to your character. Um, just knowing what these things are. Um, but the big stuff. I like I like DJ yeah. Phoenix's description. If Iron Man used Iceman's powers, you'd get absolute zero. Absolutely. Oh gosh. And in the main, oh, just thinking about the main game, getting like all of the equipment, getting stronger and stronger as each mission progresses. It's so fun. Um, but here on the second page of the character sheet, this is like the meat of the game. And I want to talk about this because uh, the Sentinel comic system uses a wild um, mechanic, I suppose, called uh, called the, the gyro system, uh, which stands for green, yellow, red, and out. And, Basically, in this game, you, I mean, imagine that you are a superhero in a comics world, right? Um, you have characters that are very, very good when stuff is super, super tense, right? Um, when uh, when it's the end of the world, uh, when he needs to, Superman is going to like dig deep and like blast out with some I-beams, right? Um, but if he's just stopping people from robbing a bank, is he going to use I-beams for that? I mean, probably not. It's not a big tense situation. He can just like you know, flick some people in the head and that'll work. Um, this game is built around that concept. There are scenes that start in green, very, very nice, very calm, move on to, uh-oh, a little more stressful and then move on to a little bit more painful. You also have a health range, which is similarly split up into green, yellow, and red. And uh, basically anytime you're playing the game, you look at your health, you look at the, the scene, whichever one is worse, those are the kind of abilities that you can use. And you can see that the bottom of this character sheet is split into green, yellow, and red. You don't get to use your red powers until it's red time. Like you're down to your last couple hit points or last couple health, excuse me, or in the most tense scene possible. I love this. Um, Absolute Zero is a character um, that is pretty good in all those types of scenes. You can see they have a D8. Um, they've got a physical representation of the die for each one of those. But other characters might have a D10 for green, 
and a D6 for red because they're someone who's really good when it's just normal. I'm, I'm good at like hacking things. When, uh, you know, when stuff gets super chaotic, uh, I'm not as good at stuff. And uh, I love that because it feels very comic book. It feels very different than what I often get out of like a D&D &D dungeon crawl for sure. Um, there is some sort of, excuse me, like resource management stuff there, but this is just like naturally in the system, um, which I like a lot. Whew. Yes, uh, moving on real quick. The, the way this game works is every time you do a thing, you're going to roll three dice. And they're going to be based on what power you're using, what quality you're attaching to that, and what status the scene is in. So like I said, if you were uh, not so good at the yellows, you've got only a D6 there and you're in the yellow scene, one of your dice is going to be a yellow. You're going to roll all three of them and you're going to line them up. Whichever got the highest, your max, whichever got the lowest, the min and the mid. And your abilities are based on what you roll. Some of them might say, okay, in this scene, you're going to do damage equal to your, your mid die. Or in this scene, because it's red, oh my gosh, you're going to do min plus max and add them together for damage. And it's just fun to throw three dice all the time. It's fun to like build a dice pool based on your things. And you look at your qualities and you're like, um, I think I'm going to be a little bit more of this today instead of a little bit more like that, get the most benefit I can. Um, so if we go back to another character, this is Muse. Um, Muse is a very psychic character with this, this inner demon, this darkness that can potentially come out. Um, but uh, if you take a look at that second page, power is a lot of illusion, intuition, invisibility, suggestion, telekinesis, and these qualities about awakened mind or conviction or creativity. This is a character that really digs deep when things get tense. They get a D12. Um, so their maximum die is probably going to be pretty high. And they're going to do a lot of stuff. So I love it because my character sheet is this dynamic thing. I'm putting together a lot of elements in order to do anything. And it's just kind of fun. Like, what can I do right now? What's what's my best move in this moment? Which is a really fun thing instead of, you know, just, well, what's my best ability? I'm going to use that. And then my second best and then my third best. Like, in this game, it all depends. Um, monsters work the same way. This is Fright Train. <laughs> this is a big, huge tank character. This big bruiser. Um, they also have powers and qualities. They have health, so you're damaging them a whole lot. Uh, some of the enemies, like in Sentinels of the Multiverse, this is Biomancer. Biomancer, um, his status is based on how many minions are in play. And the more of them you defeat, the stronger Biomancer gets. So you kind of you maybe want to punch Biomancer out before defeating all of their minions. Um, cool abilities in here like flesh crafting, you know, awesome stuff. Uh, minions are just dice. And there's the five dice in the game. And every time you beat them up enough, they lower their die type and they keep lowering them. And if you get them down to a D4, they can't do much damage and then they're gone out of the game, which I think is Ravenous fantastic. guppies was the description. <laughs> oh yeah. <laughs> oh yeah. Those D4s. That's why I put this on here. Cause they're great. Like damaged bots, ravenous guppies. I like that sharks are a D8 and laser sharks are a D10. <laughs> Good examples of minions there. Uh, the game also, of course, in every superhero comics game, you're not just fighting enemies. There's stuff going on. So uh, one of the actions that you can take is attack. One of them is defend. Uh, but one of the most important ones is overcome, which is uh, you need to help the scene all move along. And you have to do the things that the minions and the villains are trying to stop you from doing, like accessing the codes, dealing with seismic thumpers. Who knows? Um, and you and your, using your overcome ability will help you succeed at these tasks and move the scene along. These scenes are not just you go in a room and there's three kobolds. These scenes are epic. Like these scenes are entire like movie, like 20 minute sort of things, right? So there is not just there's a final boss I got to fight. It's I'm moving in and I see the storm approaching and like things are changing because of that. And then the storm hits and then like even more stuff. And then the boss comes out at the final bit. That's all the same scene in this game. So it's a very cool, fluid way to run encounters and, and build all these things together. A um, couple specific things that I really like about this game. Um, every attack hits. That's not the important thing. Your attack hits. You're a superhero, right? You punch the, You want to punch the villain, you do it. The question is, how much damage are you going to do? And so um, there's a lot of like armor and, and you know stuff going on there. It's very cool. I enjoy that. Uh, I also enjoy that in this game, initiative is shared. You just pass it to other people. So whenever your turn ends, you just decide who's going to go next. Um, you also can't die in this game uh, unless you decide your character dies. <laughs> so whenever you <laughs> drop to like zero... 
it's up to you to decide what happens to your character. We know comics. <laughs> you come back. Yeah. Um, awesome. There's also a ton of character creation stuff in here. There's lots of tables. You can build characters totally randomly if you want to, and it's really fun to do and see what you get. Uh, I've done it before. Um, but there's also lots of choices and a lot of freedom in how you write what these abilities are. I mean, superhero games are hard because there's so many possibilities. So many things are so similar. Like, what's the difference between, like, Iron Man got mentioned, Iron Man and Iron Hearts. Like, they're the different characters with different abilities. Um, and they're kind of similar at the same time. So would they be the same character class? Are they different? I don't know. Um, this game dives into it really well. And I think if you're looking for a superhero game that really gives you all of that, uh, you should absolutely check this game out. Sentinel Comics RPG. Um, oh, I just want to run like five games of this immediately. <laughs> <laughs> awesome. Well... Speaking of uh, RPG games that I want to run constantly, uh, I think our guest is in the green room and ready. So uh, we're going to swing on over there and start talking to Alex. And uh, we'll catch up with Rich here in just a little bit. Hello, Alex. How are you doing? Hi, I'm good. How are you doing today? Good. Uh, let's see here. Um, I Audience, I'm joined today by Alex Flagg, uh, the man behind Crafty Games. So, Well, one of them. One of them. Yeah, yeah. Okay. <laughs> no, <laughs> no, case, I, <laughs> no, no. <clears throat> Patrick he, he is, Pera is the other, the he other is, master he's, my mind. Is, so. He's Crafty Games. Uh, mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, they have put out games such as uh, Spycraft, Fantasycraft, uh, Storm Hollow, Mistborn, and uh, coming up soon, Burrow. Burrow? Burrow. Buru. 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 Okay, yes. thank you. Mm -hmm. I, yeah. I, mm -hmm. I, yeah. I am so glad that you are here to pronounce that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I do a lot of pronunciation guides for people to pronounce That's... these Javanese names and stuff like that. So Yeah. Oh, man. Yeah. So let's see here. Uh, let's see. I initially met you at a convention uh, mm -hmm. with, with uh, I believe, our mutual friend, Teo Sabadaya. Right, yeah. Mm -hmm. And yep. uh, you were, at the time, demoing uh, Mistborn, and, uh, and, and I believe we played some Spycraft while there. Um, yeah, yeah. So... I kind of wanted to hit to, to pick your brain a little bit. I've been talking about conventions a lot because I know okay. a lot of us are are getting ready to to hit up the convention season, uh, mm. and and we all have to make decisions on how we're going to to navigate that. Um, and I and I remember you. I believe you posted a, a a Twitter thread about what it means to be a smaller game company and going to conventions. Um, yeah. Okay. And I post uh, a lot of Twitter threads, so it's like yeah. Whoop, yep. whoop. <laughs> yeah. Oh, uh, in the chat says Storm Hollow is amazing. Um, <laughs> so, yeah, no, no. Es Escapade Games, who who created that game, they're they're fantastic folks. So we yeah. were. Uh, it was a big get for us. We're very happy with it. So yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, we're we're gonna we're planning on bringing it back. Um, mm -hmm. So the current edition is sold out. So we'll be bringing it back in a new kind of smaller format. So yeah. it's a little more accessible in terms of price and distribution yeah so what does what does the world look like to you now in this uh midst pandemic world as far as like conventions and what what what, what are some of the things that you're taught you and your company are talking about doing uh well i mean so, so conventions are i mean i i i, I say a lot of, about a lot of things um <laughs> on twitter but the um i i think conventions are the fact of the matter is in this entire industry, one of the most important things you can do is to hand sell, right? Mm -hmm. So, I mean, the number of times I have, even in this virtual world we've had for the last year, um, I still have to close deals by having conversations one-on-one -on -one with people in social media, mm -hmm. e email, stuff like that. And conventions are hands down the best place to do hand sales. Um, so, you know, we would go, we could make all our uh, money back from Gen Con by just selling. You know, mm -hmm. like being there and putting the games in front of people and they're like, oh, yeah. And I think it comes down to, I, I think maybe the thread you're referring to was me the, the, uh, talking about how gamers are. Like, I, I think mm -hmm. gamers generally are very curious. They're open to new experiences um, and uh, they want to buy. Like, yeah. they're enthusiastic. So w when you're at a show, when you're um, talking to them about your game, you're showing the excitement, you're showing the enthusiasm, you're letting them touch and feel smell the books i smell the books i know lots of people smell the books so oh, yeah uh, <laughs> and so like letting it get their hands on see the game in action 
and hear somebody who's excited about it and genuine about it can talk about it in depth and have a you know connect with them on that level it this sales close themselves so Absolutely. i think that's a really important thing um but you know fact of matters even conventions you're well off if you make your money back because they're mm -hmm. huge in investments the other part about conventions is so important is you're going there to make connections with friends so yeah we're a distributed industry but very few people have offices um we never travel just to see each other or have powwows or whatever so you know we're gonna be um you know, so you, that's your chance to see your friends yeah. you know uh you're, it's a chance to reconnect with people who have supported your product and are your uh standard bearers out there in the community um it's a chance for you to let people peek under the hood. It's a chance to make easy connections with media. So, I mean, you know, for us, uh, in terms of like our business hub was always shows like Gamma Trade Show, mm -hmm. but especially Gen Con, you know, that's, we've been going to Gen Con for as crafty for 15 years. So, um, yeah, so it's, it's harder now. Uh, virtual mm -hmm. conventions are not a substitute in terms of sales or in terms of connection. Um, but that's because they haven't figured out how to, have the walk by experience you know like yeah. so much of being if for folks who've never been to gen con or you know, any reasonably sized show one of the best parts about it is like walking the floor and then stumbling across something you'd never heard of before um and so that that's part of the kind of magic of it is like seeing something new and like what is this game what what are these people playing they're having so much fun or like what's what's this i would never seen this miniature before or i've never seen this artist before and it's mm -hmm. and, and it gives you so much more you can open up new doors and make new friends and all of that other stuff so yeah i mean that's conventions are kind of like the beating heart of the gaming the community i even though they're you know sort of an elite event most people don't get a chance to go to them um they're it, it, there's a lot of vitality that comes out of them that kind of yeah. fuels the industry. So. Oh, that's that's uh, that's awesome. Are you guys um, eyeballing Gen Con this year? Or are you? Uh, we are not going in person this year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. I I, I know that's been a, a a tough decision for a lot of folks. Um, yeah. Whether whether they feel safe going this year or not. Was well, it uh, one of our volunteers that actually made a really good point? So we're going to be virtually attending. Um, yeah. You know, but the. Uh, you know, so they have to do safety precautions. You know, they're mm -hmm. going to have to, they're, they're going to try to enforce cleaning rules, masks as much as they can, um, which is going to, you know, always an issue um, to have uh, social distancing reinforced. And, but, you know, if you've never been to a con like Gen Con, you are crammed into every single space with people shoulder to shoulder for four or five days and you fly mm -hmm. in an air. Usually you have to fly in an airplane to get there and back. And so, um, you know, for us, like there's so many points where things could go wrong. And then if you have a lower attendance, um, it affects your sales. It affects yeah. the people that can go. And so for us, like it's hard enough to make, to break even on a show. Yeah. And then to say like, well, you're going to have to go, you're going to do the, all the same work and it absorbed the same costs and pay for a booth and everything. And then still not have a significantly lower level of, and they have certain rules about sales to keep um, people from running across the show floor. Uh, you yeah. can't do exclusives. And so, you know, these are things that make good sense, but they do affect the kind of chances of return on the show. So it was a business decision yeah. more than anything. Yeah. yeah, no, it, you know, the, the, that's the stuff that's kind of, at least to me is super fascinating. I, I, I like hearing about the behind the scenes stuff. Like, sure. um, I, I, I love, love your explanation as to why cons are so good and, and why you're not going to Gen Con this year. Um, it do, hurts. It does. You know, yeah. yeah. And there's not, and there's not really, like you said, there's not really a great way to, to, to accommodate that face to face sale. Um, right. um, so what kind of things are you guys doing to to get your your voices heard um amidst the noise <laughs> well it's I, I mean this is where folks who have really strong earned media are mm -hmm. better off you know so it's uh i mean like a lot of things we've seen in the pandemic the uh companies that were already in good shape uh in terms of presence um mm -hmm. and profile are doing better yeah. and you know because the game uh, in the tabletop games sector the sales are up Overall, yeah. you know, I mean, D and D has had explosive growth for years. It's even done even better this year, you know, because role playing games are quite adaptable to mm -hmm. virtual tabletops. We had a lot of 
r- runway on that, but you know, like things like board games, not so much. Right. Um, and so, you know, that's been, there's been a lot of scramble and the backpedaling figure people figuring things out. Um, but, you know, uh, so I think it's, we're doing our best to con- maintain connection to our, you know, our customer base and our, our fans and stuff like that. So, yeah, we've opened a discord channel, uh, which we're still kind of new to and, and mm-hmm. not terribly good at to be a Frank. Yeah. Um, you know, and I, I think we just do kind of what we were doing already. Uh, th- there's only so much you can do. I mean, paid advertising has been kind of important. Yeah. Um, it'll be interesting to see what the impact is on sales of some of the things we plan to release this year. Um, yeah. You know, because uh, again, Gen Con was you take something new to a show and you could sell through whatever you brought usually. Yeah. Um, and so not having that kind of rollout, not having the hype, not having the word of mouth is going to, I think this is the year where we're going to see that affected because you know a lot of people would have debuted stuff in 2019 uh so things that released in 2020 um you know they were kickstarted in 2019 or they had kind of the con boost this year everything that's coming out this year didn't have that Mm -hmm. and so you know i wouldn't be surprised if we see kind of depressed you know uh retail sales and um maybe uptake of things they're probably i imagine it'll be a little more atomized in terms of uh, how people grab latch on to new things yeah so yeah yeah, you and and you've mentioned that board games have done fairly well, and you have one in the that the Kickstarter is launching for tomorrow. Right. Mm-hmm. Uh, yep. And, and and we brought it up briefly. Uh, tell us a little bit about that game. I, I I gave a little bit of a a a, a summary, but I I think you'll do it much better than I did. Okay. Yeah. So um, this game is called Buru. Um, it is a uh, it is a midweight euro game. So you know it it's not super. Uh, like Ameritrash, you're not like bashing heads or anything right. like that. Um, yeah, so it's a game where you are playing uh, explorers from the Majapahit Empire. It's it's historically flavored, um, but we kind of we have it as the it's just kind of a story is about the clash or not the clash the encounter of uh, two different cultures uh, set in the 14th century in Indonesia, um, and so you are explorers that go to this island. You um, and you send your people out to explore the island and make connections with the islanders uh, and then to pay tribute to their spirits. And the goal is to kind of uh, build a, a trade relationship with the folks on the island. Uh, and the island's name is Buru. Oh, so, nice. yeah. So we got this game. Um, it was our first outside board game design. So we did Mistborn House War. We had done mm-hmm. the Mistborn Adventure game, the role-playing game. And then we did uh, Mistborn House War was our first board game. And... Um, we released that. We kickstarted it in, I think, in 2016. I've been getting the years wrong. It's been a while since bringing Buru out. And yeah. we we met the designer of Buru um, at that show. Really liked the game and brought it in. So it's it's a it's a game I would call kind of like um, a post gateway game. So it's not a mm-hmm. uh, it'll be it's one that's des- that if somebody's familiar, if they play Catan or some of the kind of classic yeah. intro games into Euros and stuff like that, beyond roll and move games. Mm-hmm. Um, Buru is going to be very easy to pick up and play. Yeah, I was demoing to a potential licensor, and and the the uh, it was the CEO of the company, and he's like, "Oh, you know, I'm not very good at Euro games." And I said, "You know, try this one. I, you're not going to be bad at this game." And um, so he got it like instantly, and then really enjoyed it. So it's a really super smooth experience. Mm-hmm. Um, the theme is quite unique. It's gorgeous. Uh, I don't, yeah. I can't see like what's being shown on the channel, but like. It's, the art is spectacular. So we actually got an Indonesian artist. We had Indonesian cultural consultants. Um, you know, I did a bunch of historical research and stuff like that to kind of do my best to take and match the the um, theme of the game and to the art, to the to kind of all the aspects of the game, stuff like that. Because that's kind of my role playing background. Mm-hmm. Um, I really think theme first, and yeah. um, you know. The fact of the matter is, like, even with board games, which are, tend to be more about the mechanics and our shorter experience is not as deeply as immersive, I think the way that people approach games, um, no matter what format, is when we talk about games, we talk about their themes. We don't talk about their mechanics. Exactly. Um, and so I think uh, it's so important it, uh, that, you know, board gamers in particular really get stuck on mechanics. Well, what's the novel? Well, you know, okay, well, this has blind bidding, but, you know, how do you, how do you, do that and how is this balanced and blah 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 and you know and i think in the same way role-playing nerds do the same thing where the people get really into the mechanics and stuff like Mm -hmm. our games you know especially our uh, craft games tend to be very more mechanically heavy Mm -hmm. um but theme is got to inform everything It, it 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 binds it all together and really helps people grok it and when they talk to each other they don't talk about 
they don't start with the mechanics. They start with the theme. What are you doing and why? Um, and so like, that's, I, I try to like infuse as much theme as I can here. So this was a really like fun um, exercise to kind of dig down into, you know, a piece of history that's kind of lost to time. And a lot of it wasn't written down and then do, oh, wow. do, yeah, you know, it, it's stuff. There's like two or three written records from that period. Oh, um, wow. Yeah, well, I mean, one of them is an epic poem that talks about the life of this great king. And um, and in that is the mention of the island. And I was like, ah, that's the hook. That's where we're going to do the connection. So, yeah, so um, we're really proud of it. It's going to be on Kickstarter to uh, the 17th. So that's Monday, tomorrow. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah, and uh, so, um, but you were really excited. I'd love for folks to check it out. Um, yeah. You know, just go to Buru Game. That's B U R U G A M E dot com, mm -hmm. and you can get on there. You can try it out. If you have Tabletop Simulator, it's free to try. Uh, we just got the mod redone today, so oh, wow. uh, yeah. So you can kind of dig in there, try it out, see what you think about it, and uh, and we have all sorts of fancy gubbins and a deluxe edition and stuff. And it's Ooh. yeah. So yeah. Anyway, yeah. So um, yeah, it's it's a it's a really great game. I, I really awesome. enjoy it. Yeah. Awesome. That's yeah. That's 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 super rad. I'm uh, I'm very excited about it. I I I, I think that that mid level Euro game is that sweet spot too. That's just it's super yeah. easy to pick up with your friends and play. And uh, yeah, I love it. And, well, you don't feel you don't feel dumb like playing yeah. some games. It's just you're mentally exhausted. You just fall over when right? you're done. But I, I <laughs> it's it, so I've been going to BGG Con for a couple of years since mm -hmm. I, as I've pivoted and doing more uh, board game work in addition to my role playing work and um, the. Uh, you know, I used to go and people would want to play this, you know, something with a, a bajillion bits and it would take up the entire table. It was all this like, let's spend all day playing this thing. But you know, even in the last couple of years that I've been going, you know, I'd hear especially designers talking to each other. Oh, how long is this game? Somebody would say, I heard, or heard this one conversation stuck with me. It's like, well, OK, well, what is the game? Mm -hmm. well, how long does it take to play? 45 minutes? Oh, thank God. You know, <laughs> <Right>? <laughs> they, you know like they're, yeah. well, the goal is like we're in a time and you're seeing this in role-playing games too mm -hmm. um where people want to have smaller games they don't have to commit their lives to to play they're not like they're not looking for lifestyle games like when you're a kid and you had time but not money right. um you know and you didn't have as many choices um now people want to sample like if they want the buffet of games they want to have different experiences what can i have how can i play more games how can i have more satisfying small experiences you know, and then move on and have something else and try it again. And then I can come back to this one. And do I remember how to play it? Do I have to? So that's the advantage of like midway mm -hmm. and light games is that you don't have to go through all this mental gymnastics to remember how to play or to figure out how to play or get other people into it. And so that's, I think that's a growth, a growth area. And it's funny because I, one of the big board game designers out there like was saying others oh, know like that's the games that are going to die off are the midway ones that you either have to be super light or they have to be really heavy. And I think, I think that overlooks the folks that are just burn out on mm -hmm. big complicated things. And so, I mean, this is, this is informing how I'm looking at um, games like Spycraft third edition yeah. that I'm working on. So I'm excited for that. Let me tell you, <laughs> one of my favorite, it's been a process. One of my favorite stories is, a, is, is Teos playing Spycraft. Um, <laughs> and, and he's starting with, with, with a car jumping a big jump and, and that's where the scene starts in here. <laughs> going um that's one of the products i've always wanted to do is the in midi arrest thing where you you're like oh okay you're running down the street so you, so you guys are shooting at you who is it what am i doing you know like exactly. that's such a great way to start a spy game absolutely yeah. uh all right so um if you want to know more about this stuff go to crafty-games.com uh uh buru game.com uh I, I wanted to make sure i said it right <laughs> and uh go check those games out definitely back to kickstarter follow alex on uh, twitter's it's alex flag mm -hmm. on twitter and uh and actually alex is going to stick around for with us for this next bit where we are going to uh use your particular guide to help us build an adventure Oh, okay. <laughs> <laughs> so, We're going to build an adventure today. Cool. Well, I, you know, so what we do is we typically just outline an adventure with the help of chat. And you have this cool Mistborn style. So okay. uh, Rich, is, Rich is back with us now. And uh, I'm going to move to closed captioning a little bit because I realized I'm blocking it. There we go. And uh, here we go. So to Mistborn style, 
let's let's talk let's talk about the mist mistborn style well so okay um so i wrote this guide um this is part of a methodology i've developed to train freelancers and how to write adventures mm -hmm. um and so um mistborn is based on a novel series by brandon sanderson uh if you haven't read it it's very epic fantasy um you mm -hmm. know it starts out as kind of a heist and then goes into gods and men and all this other world changing events stuff like that and so one of the challenges we had from the very beginning uh when when i was starting development on this game was like how do we make the game feel like mistborn because you know when you're not going to be the principal characters and i with licensed games in particular um i think the worst sin you can commit is like you can't be you can only be as cool as somebody who's not as cool as the guys you see on the screen so <laughs> right. you know no yeah. i mean there was i was a decipher did a lord of the rings game and it was like okay um great so lord of the rings you can't play strider everything that they're doing is still happening you can't affect anything and you know whereas and i was like that's completely the wrong tactic. like coming in and saying you can't do it or the old star wars uh sorry the d20 star wars where it's like do you have the skywalker feet <laughs> and if you don't have the Skywalker feet, you can't be as cool as the Skywalker. And the Skywalker feet is limited. It's just something the GM made yeah. up to wave around in front of you and say, like, you can't be Darth Vader. You know, like that's <laughs> it, it's so obnoxious. And so like the game's like, but I think the industry has learned, you know, you look at the one ring and the one mm -hmm. ring is like, what we're mm -hmm. going to do is we're going to take the game. We're going to lift it out. We're going to put it in a time between where you see the principles of the Hobbit and the principles of Lord of the Rings and say, this is where you guys get to be the, the, the fellowship in between mm -hmm. these stories. You can counter the ring, you can encounter characters, you, you could run into Gollum, you can have all those things, but um, it, it's an open sandbox bookended by two things that are familiar. And um, I think, you know, that's how we approached Mistborn. You know, we assume the principles exist, but that the, you know, the sandbox is kind of around the rough time you can kind of choose. And so you can choose, are you ever going to encounter them? Um, you know, are you going to happen before or after the events of the first mm -hmm. novel, which are pretty substantial. Mm -hmm. And, but we wanted to make sure that characters felt like they were moving the, the narrative themselves, that they were, um, that things were high stakes, that they had control over what was happening, that they didn't feel afraid to do stuff like I'm only a level one peasant, you know, like you don't want any of that yep. stuff. Yeah. So it was like kind of starting out where characters feel like they've already developed and that they, they are already the best of the best or not the best of the best, you know, in the same way that like thieves, uh, sorry, blades in the dark mm -hmm. is like, you're just already oceans 11. And so now you just do what you're going to do. Um, but I want to give constantly remind players that they control the narrative and they feel like they have control of it without it going spiraling every which way. Yeah. I, I, I like that you, on the key elements of Mistborn style. I, I like the, the portion in which you say heroes are crucially important. Their actions change the world. Yeah. Um, and I, and yeah, and I agree with you. I think that's important. I think you, you, when you're, when you're writing a, an adventure, you want to make sure the heroes are the heroes. You don't want right. to make sure you don't want the heroes to be background characters in their own story. Right. Yeah, exactly. You got to feel like there's a risk, but that, that your decisions matter to the world in some way, even if it is the consequences of the things you do blow back. Mm -hmm. um, but, you know, and that you also feel like there's something to discover because that those are those are the things that happen in the books. They're the, the characters are kind of discovering that what they're doing is changing the world. And I, I think that's we want the players to constantly feel that they're important in the same way without saying you're discovering the same things that the novels you know, was discovered in the novels. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, so I, I think the ways you do that is you've got to make sure that people feel like they're self-determining, mm -hmm. right? And uh, I think the mistake that we have, that we make as game masters, um, and, and as people who play um, play sandbox video games, mm -hmm. is that we pretend that the sandboxes are actually sandboxes. You know, that you know, because role-playing games allow for infinite possibilities and huge worlds and you know you can do anything we think that the only way to really allow self-determination is to allow anything but what that is just total chaos no we are not computers and <laughs> yes. you play an open play an open world game sometime i mean honestly take the big take world of warcraft mm -hmm. there are areas you can't go in world of warcraft there are doors you can't open yeah. it, it, it's been around for 20 years and there's still it's still not infinitely expandable you can't do anything you want i mean can you eat a sandwich in world of warcraft like can you pick up a sa can you make a sandwich no <laughs> no I, well, so this is the thing you know, this is a trap i fell into uh, it, stepping back to design 
mm -hmm. briefly. So when we were designing Spycraft 2.0, you've seen Justin, you've seen, yes, you played. Okay, so it was a thousand words a page, five hundred pages. It's a half million words of rules. Yeah. Um, and I'll tell you, uh, by making everything, almost everything, have a rule attached to it. As soon as there wasn't something, like people were like, well, "Where are my sandwich rules?" Mm -hmm. You know, like it, it's a never-ending pit. And ultimately, what I did is I we and it ended up allowing people to go the wrong way. Like they would focus more on their character's lifestyle than they would on how am I being a spy? Right? Because mm -hmm. they had we had rules for lifestyle. People were like, well, I'm going to play in this sandbox. And mm -hmm. you 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 know, I mean, it's like you don't ask your child when you take them out into the winter. You don't say. What do you want to wear? You say, do you want to wear your red coat or your blue coat? This is, this so is important I, lessons for, for parents yeah. out there, by the way. Yeah, yeah. Well, but I think it, it's not to infantilize our players, but we have to think about the same way for players. They yeah. need, they need um, bumpers, but not mm -hmm. they don't want to be on rails. They don't want to say, like, here, put on your red coat. They want, I can choose what coat I want to wear, or maybe I want to wear a vest. Like, mm -hmm. I'm still wearing something warm and I'm still going outside. That is the kind of, I think that is structurally the way you, they do need to be guided. And that doesn't mean they need to be told. And right. so that's kind of how we split the difference is you're always trying to balance the feel that there's risk, that there's self-determination, that there's, um, that there are, the players have choice in what they do and what their choices impact how the game plays. Yeah. But by the same token, that um, that your story and the the plot you're doing is still being reinforced and guided. Because how many times have we like, oh, okay, you guys can do whatever, and they're like, I'm going to refuse the hero's call. Yep. Right, right. Yeah. <laughs> you know the yeah. classic. The man in the tavern points to you and says, "I have a mission for you," and you're like, "Yeah." And you yeah. know, I want to go hit up the barmaid. And how <laughs> many times has that happened and derail a whole session? Right. Exactly. So. It's like you've got to, and so what you do is you carve away the stuff that doesn't matter by basically putting it outside the bumpers. Maybe they can see it, but they can't touch it in the same way you can see out of zone stuff in a video game, but can't affect it. Can't go there. Mm -hmm. And then you, and then you say, and then they have a clear set of understandings like, I can't go there, so I'm probably going to go this way. And then they'll find something fun there and then they'll be pulled, right? They'll want to go it, uh, go that way and feel like they can control and choose their paths in that box or in that channel. Right. Yeah. No. And, and, and yeah, we're, I, I, I flipped us to the branches bottle or branches, clues and bottlenecks. And I, you know, bumpers, right. not rails is our motto. I think that's, I think that's something that, that, that adventure writers, uh, and this may just turn into adventure writing workshop and not an actual <laughs> adventure writing thing. And that's cool. Uh, but I, yeah. but I think that's something that, 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 that we need to remember as, as adventure writers is we're, we're, we're writing the story but they're acting out the characters within it. So right. you, you, you can't let them just totally go into left field because that's not part of the story. Mm -hmm. Right, exactly. I mean, my, my, uh, my folks never understood role-playing games. Um, when I was, you know, I, there was something I did in their books I read and there were things I did with my friends they didn't understand. And my mom one day asked me, I was like, so what do you do when you make these things? Mm -hmm. And I was like, uh, uh, let's call making a role-playing game writing the beginning to 50 different novels you know like you are trying it, it really is you, what you're doing is you're doing all the groundwork of, of building a setting setting context setting up reasons and hooks for people to grab onto but then you don't write you don't write in the main action you just set up all the you set up all the pins and let the players knock them over mm -hmm. and so i think that is a that's an important way to contextualize what you're doing is you're not trying to you've got to write the beginning of the novel and then you've got to push the characters guide the characters into action yeah um and so they, they're they're playing that game for a reason right they love the setting they love the mechanics there's there's a reason they're there and so you want your everything your mechanics your setting your and your stories to all come together to remind them why they're playing it and let them play in a play the game that they have opted to play with you right, right. so you don't try to make well i'm going to make D, D a game about politics i you, people are like but i wanted to do dungeon crawls you know and your setting is about dungeon crawls it's going to whip them right out and you're going to lose immersion and pff, mm -hmm. everything goes to pieces yeah so yeah this is about marrying those two things together with narrative structure and adventure structure um and so i have like three tools i use here so 
the the way I build a channel is I kind of look at there are there's branches, there's clues, and there's bottlenecks. So branches are ways where we address when we're when we're building a plot. Mm -hmm. You look at different ways people can approach that plot, and th those are fairly structured. I'll talk about that in a second um, because players they have certain moves, you know, role playing yeah. games and scrims, sure. <laughs> and so you kind of if you build around these broad styles you'll figure out how you can kind of plan for that without actually writing like something scripted clues are the thing that people get so they follow these branches they're going to scoop off these clues which are going to help them in the future right um and then the bottlenecks are things that you need to have happen to make your adventure work so um what you want to do is you are going to start with your beginning it's going to branch out you're going to go through these things and you're going to fork off and players are going to choose the fork they take. Right. So mm -hmm. imagine if you're playing mass effect, since that just came out, you're choosing, are you going to take the, the good guy or the Paragon, the rogue, mm -hmm. or the kind of central dialogue options. And those, but those lead to something. And along those branches are set certain clues, which will be things that propel or are useful in the story later. Mm -hmm. And then you come, but you always bring them back to a central thing. So they, they kind of go out to an encounter along their branches, a sub encounter, mm -hmm. and then they're going to come back to a central event, which, so, you know, just like, um, this is how all choose your adventure stories work that right. eventually you have to encounter this, the evil wizard, right? So you may go left, you may go right, you may go straight on but you are eventually all going to get back to the, the wizard. And so you got to think about it like that. So it's, it's going out along the branches. Players have their little result of their choice. Then it goes back in. And so you have to build around those. And so it, usually you're going to look if, if the adventure were a flow chart and I'll show you the flow charts, it, it's going to look like an eight, you know, like that's kind of the standard thing. So you imagine you have your, you kind of have your middle event is your first major one. And then you have a, a kind of final event if you're Bridge writing a standard yeah. yeah exactly so you can do two bulbs together and you can do that ad infinitum if you want to uh if you have a don't have a formal structure so uh okay, okay. so yeah good. yeah i have the bottleneck example up so what we okay. see is the plot here is free kidnapped ally from the gang uh, yeah. Then you have your choices, which is fight, outwit, or talk. And you mentioned mm -hmm. before, like, you can't go from, uh, you know, you, you can't cross all three of these in an encounter. But right. you could go outwit and then fight, or you could go f talk and then fight, or fight and then talk. Right. So I, I, I could see how two of them would work. And yeah. then uh, and then you choose your path, and that's when uh, you have the action. And then it comes mm -hmm. to the conclusion, which then leads to another branch. That's about... Yeah, yeah, basically, basically. So you you have these kind like of like it. crucial plot plot crucial events are your bottlenecks, and there, mm -hmm. so a bottleneck sounds bad, but it's easy to remember. Because um, mm -hmm. yeah, again, we're we're just trying to push everybody through this one gate to make sure that you know you've got the stakes are risen. This this crucial world changing event happens. This guy, you have your first fight and you lose against this guy. Whatever it has to be, mm -hmm. um, but you're setting those things up. So you're looking at page twenty, Justin. Is that uh, let's see, I'm at uh, yes twenty. Yeah, twenty. So if you skip back, like when you're structuring to go this, if we can go back to branches. So the three branches that I have are fight, talk, and outwit. Mm -hmm. So uh, basically it, it's, you know, do you, do people, when they're encountered with a thing, are they going to take it head on? Are they going to go around it? Or are they going to try to convince it <laughs> in some way? So, you know, it'd be like, right. yeah, like a direct inner, it's a non-violent or non destructive encounter so you know like yeah. i'm gonna try to parlay i'm gonna try to you know lie to it whatever so um so these this is just sort of the way that if you traditional fantasy structure the thieves are gonna usually want to outwit you know the mm -hmm. the fighters sure. and barbarians are gonna fight and you know the wizards may talk you know and that they're gonna use magic they're gonna use something else where they they confront but they don't defeat necessarily they're not going on that path um so yeah, the um, so the way I do this, assuming that players are going to approach all problems along one of these paths, mm -hmm. how do I develop a sub encounter that comes from that? And that's kind of what happens at the end of those branches. So, um, you know, okay. So if in the case somebody's been kidnapped, mm -hmm. if the players fight, what would happen? How would my uh, opposition react? Or what do you think is makes an interesting story? Okay. So, you know, so, the, and so I kind of like, that's how I'm trying to anticipate player action. 
and then develop a reaction in the story that's meaningful to that. So if we, if my friend's been kidnapped. Um, so you get to page 12, you can kind of see this, how you might lay this out. Yeah. Um, you know, like, okay, so uh, they're going to fight. They're going to just go straight in. I'm going to kick in the door and rescue my friend. You know, the outwit might be, I'm going to sneak in and break him out. Nobody's going to know. Uh, and talk is like, well, I'm going to go and I'm trying to uh, negotiate a release. Pretty easy, right? Yeah. Um, and then off of those, you can look at what would happen narratively if that occurred. So, you know, I have here like, you know, well, you're going to have this bloody battle. Do the cops come in? You know, uh, do we have this breakout? Um, but the gangsters are like, oh, we've, oh, we got to get these guys. Or, mm -hmm. you know, um, you know, again, do you, do you get caught like breaking and entering? Um, you know, this, you get this, you get your, your scam or, or your, your parlay works out. Um, but, you know, then the other team, the guys you tricked, um, get mad that they've been deceived right so all these are leading to a conflict with that mm -hmm. gang again right so like mm -hmm. you, you massacre a bunch of guys here but that's not all of them and so then you're setting up the the bottleneck right so now you're just going to be the big conflict with the gang so one you know my friend's been snatched i got to get him back that triggers a reaction from mm -hmm. them which leads to a conflict and that mm -hmm. that con that conflict is the first bottleneck so you can see like this is not you could lay something out like this without too much more writing like you don't have to script every piece but yeah. you might say okay well if i'm preparing for a battle what am i going to need i'm going to need some kidnapper stats uh right um sneaking I, oh, are there any traps do i need to have anything developed for that right. or or like what's difficulty or oh where are the guards placed i should think about that and then also with talking um okay i gotta think about who's the leader there that they would encounter or, or the principal opposition they'd be having to work through in order to get their friend back. And so that kind of lets me plan and build a simple encounter, even if it's skeletal, yeah, uh, mm -hmm. but I, cause I've already planned, I know what they're going to, how they're going to react if they get defeated along these branches. So I have something that feels very holistic, right? The players have not been told to do any one thing. I haven't closed off any doors to them. Right. Um, but I have, I'm equipped to uh, react to them without having to think on my feet entirely. Sure. Sweet. Yeah. And it's, it's really like this, this is very well-rounded. Like as I look at this and you explain this scene in particular, I keep thinking about it. Like what would I do differently that wouldn't fall into one of these three branches? And there's nothing. I mean, no, <laughs> there, there could yeah. be for sure, but right. It's yeah. just variations of these three. They're really, really solid ways to look at this. Yeah. It's, it's, it's very, it's kind of high level and seems a little abstract, but you realize that you want it to be abstracted because the players yeah. will choose their own, Mm -hmm. They'll choose their own specific paths and you need to be able to improvise within that box. But you're also sure. creating channels for yourself. Like you you have enough to work with going in. Now, this can be fleshed out to write formal adventures, right? Mm -hmm. um, you can put all sorts of hangers on it in detail. But I mean, this is the basic skeleton you use yeah. when you're writing encounters that can be taken by parties of any type and groups of any type. Um, and so then, yeah, on top of this, I'll lay on clues. So Mistborn has the importance of, mem uh, of, of mystery, right? There's always mm -hmm. something you don't know. There's you know, somebody has a dark past. There's, you know, whatever. Something comes up. Yeah. Um, so clues are something that I lay on top, which will I can use as ammo in future story, like scenes down the road, um, reinforcing the campaign. Um, and so the way I do it is I kind of think of three things because I have three brands. I'm obsessed with threes. So forgive me on this. I really do like threes. <laughs> you you, you and you. Bungie. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I'm also I'm also a de big time Destiny nerd, so that, oh, I was oh. just playing Destiny before I came up here. So, oh, oh sure, yeah, so we'll be playing after. Uh, that's, right that's exactly <laughs> what we're going to do after this. Uh, excellent. Okay, yeah. So I'm I'm enjoying the new season quite a bit. So oh, yeah, uh, me too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Chroma Rush, it's an awesome gun. So uh, good. <laughs> yeah, so good. <laughs> anyway, I can nerd about this all day, and I, I have uh, I I've, I've been fantasizing about well, what if I were to pitch Bungie on making a Destiny RPG? Um, I, I keep going back to it. I, I got to shake it loose. I got a ton of other things. To, I got to make Spycraft. <laughs> yeah. So right, um, right. anyway, I know how I do it though. Um, so, uh, so yeah, anyway, so clues, clues. Um, so clues are just things that are both useful and interesting. Um, so they don't have to be immediately pertinent, but um, what I do is I take, think of three things mm -hmm. that would be, that could come out of this whole narrative sequence. And then what I do is I mm -hmm. put access. I never want players to have everything. And the reason I don't want is like, okay, um, 
if you tell players that if they go long enough, they will get, they will be able to clean something out. They will do it. That is, it is another right. part of living in the video game world. Like, okay, all I got to do is grind and go every room. I can complete something. But the way that I, I do not, again, a way to make something meaningful to players is to make sure that there are, co- there are perks and consequences of their choices. So in this case, I take these three perks and I just uh, are clues and I put two of them on each branch. You can only access them in right. uh so so you choose your branch and you will get access to you want you will have good information that's all useful mm-hmm. to the future conflicts but you will not have all information so uh, what that means is that your choice of to fight to outwit or to talk actually matters to how you go into the next conflict or carry on in the campaign um so so i make sure every clue exists on two branches i like to have them in different configurations Mm -hmm. Um, so, so every choice is different and leads to something. So, you know, skipping down to page 16, um, you can see what I did. I built a little simple matrix here. Um, you know, I have three clues here. I have a gang, find out that the gang works for, uh, that did the kidnapping works for a noble Lord. I find out that the, uh, they're part of a bigger kidnapping ring. And then I, uh, or I find out that there's been doing some strange experiments on people, right? So arb- these are arbitrary things. And so I just build them in different configurations. So the, if you go through this, you know, uh, well, in fight, I can discover that they're, they're I, I walk into a lab, I assault the base, and I discover that the lab, there's this laboratory, and there's some grisly tools around. And, and then I also find a, a writ of, of a contract that they're following. Okay, great. But, you know, maybe on the outwit branch, um, I have, I discover that grisly stuff because I've snuck in through the front door and that or the the back door and I discover there's a lab right there, right? But then I also see two guys outside talking about you know well, what about the guys in the other city? Okay, mm-hmm. great. And then you know I can overhear that. I don't have to do anything more. Um, and then you know in the talking thing, I'd like the guy's like, well, I work for so and so, or he he can tell you, or you can see he's wearing a pin, or he he's mm-hmm. an actual representative from the lo- lo- local lord. And you're like what's this guy doing here? Right. And then you also see, he was like, I've got friends everywhere. He says something like that. So yeah, it, 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 they get the information again. These are not hard. All I want them to do is get that piece of information. I don't care how they get it or what, how it manifests, but at least then when the players go forward, they can kind of maybe utilize that to their advantage or use that for the conclusion, or they can mm-hmm. use that to pressure somebody else or may guide them into a different track, you know? Um, so the clues are not necessary. Uh, you know, I think if you're building basic encounters, you can skip the clues. Yeah. But if you have something, if you want to build further meaning and look at the bigger picture of your mm-hmm. campaign or your adventure, um, clues are, that's how I would do it is that, so every wow. choice is cutting something off, but all the, you're getting enough essential information. It can push you. The yeah. players are well equipped that they have done something yeah. that is important for themselves. I, I like that as well, because it's, you know, I, we want the games also to be fun for us. Like if you're going to write and run this adventure a couple of times, you yeah. kind of want it to be a little different. You just did that for yeah. yourself. Like right. I, I really like sharing secrets that you don't share with everyone. It's really right. great. <laughs> well, and, and, well, and see, and this is good for, for written adventures in particular. Mm-hmm. This is good because that means the player, how the players approach it um, will lead to, it will, uh, invariably introduce variation to how right. the conclusion of the thing. And if you yeah. build along this structure all the time, that means, you know, group a plays the game this way. And because of the choices they made, they have a different conclusion. They'll have the same big encounters. Oh, I didn't like the fight against, you know, I had to fight Aramis, you know, I had to fight this person, but uh-huh. in the end, the way I did, it was different. Um, oh, but you know, we took, we decided to like sneak around and steal this thing, you know, because we had this, we knew that we knew that, you know, so and so was working with these lords, so I'd want to start a fight with them. So I wanted to go around and, and do it this other way. Whereas the other guy's like, oh yeah, we talked to them and we realized they're a bunch of wusses and we just kicked their ass. <laughs> yeah, you know. So yeah, right. But it, but it means like with with published adventures, you're gonna have people that actually have totally different experiences, but they have the same core plot. They can follow right. the same core plot. So that's why this structure I developed this structure so that people can have a plot line that is followed by the players. Um, but creates a a kind of important freedom inside that that lane. It's the it's the bumper bowling version, right? Do, mm-hmm. do you ricochet all the way down the lane, or do you go straight at it? Like they never jump out of the lane unless they 
throw really, really hard or really, really bad. <laughs> right. Sure. Um, yeah. But yeah, that's that. That's how it all kind of comes together. Wow. Oh man. Yeah. This is this is all amazing. Uh, and 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 like I said a little bit ago, I'm 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 actually so much happier that we had a masterclass on adventure writing instead of diving into this adventure. Um, yeah. But I mean, yeah. I know. Uh, Alex, thank you so much for <laughs> for hanging out and joining us today. Uh, Thanks for having me. Love to have you back, uh, especially now that we have your structure. Now, yeah. now, now I kind of want to go through it sometimes. So, so we'll we'll, sure. we'll touch base a little bit down the road. Maybe uh, as as DJ Phoenix asks, uh, you know, right around when Spycraft Third Edition comes out. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> That's going to be a little while. I'm I okay. am in development. Well, so a brief, if yep. you if you don't mind, oh, please. Um, do. Yeah. So I, the game is in development. Uh, I'm getting Buru launched because I was the developer on that, and I had to. I have to see that baby all the way through. Absolutely. Um, but yeah, I am going back to Spycraft again. You know, rules core is done. Uh, nice. Tails actually played it a long time ago. Oh. Um, but yeah, it's been in work yeah. a long time, and I know a lot of folks are really waiting. But it, we, it is a going thing, and we are doing some things that are different from the past. Awesome. So yeah, there's going to be a setting. That's yeah. that's what I've been focused on. So yeah, yeah. Uh, wow. sweet. Yeah, yeah. The chat, uh, DJ Phoenix in the chat, super has excited that you were here. So just giving giving little mutual shout outs and. Uh, Make sure to follow Alex Flag on Twitter. Uh, check out crafty-games.com. Uh, check out uh, boorugame.com. Mm -hmm. uh, back that Kickstarter. It looks fantastic. Uh, it really does. I'm, I'm going to be playing it for sure uh, yeah. now that I know it's on tabletop. So thanks again uh, so much for joining us, and we'll we'll talk to you again soon. Thanks, fellas. Take care. Thanks. Yeah, you too. <laughs> oh my goodness. All right. Wow, wow man. Oof. That was that was real good. Uh, we went a little really bit was. over, so I'm gonna do 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 a couple quick shout outs. Everyone, make sure to back the Patreon, uh, become a member of the Exploration Society. There's all kinds of sweet, cool perks. Make sure to check out DJ Regulars Clips of the Week. Once every so often, we have a clip worthwhile being on there. But right. uh, you know. <laughs> <laughs> uh, and then, uh, last but not least, New Pantheon is up next. Stick around, hang out for that. Uh, it's 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 going to be another great episode. So uh, make sure to let's see. Is your is your Kickstarter still going? My Kickstarter is going for another two weeks still. You can check it out. The Academy of of Adventures Summer Camp for 2021. <laughs> Perfect. Yeah. And then, of yeah. course, you can see me streaming here on Twitch every Wednesday night at 6.30 p.m. Pacific Standard Time, where we watch old movies and listen to house music. This week <laughs> is another Hercules movie. Uh, thank you, Aubrey, for saying my beard is nice. And everybody, uh, leave. Uh, make sure to uh, put your crock pockets to warm, and we'll be back next week. Thanks so much, everyone. <laughs> Uh, well, now I have to find out, oh. find, find the, the closing button. Oh, there it is.